chapter 16 is called Rubik's. The next school week passed without incident. Each of the boys had been looking forward to catching up with Kasima, eager to pass on their plans for Mr. Torrance and the Prime Minister, and keen to find her, out her opinion on Becky's involvement. They'd been waiting for her at the school gates on the Monday morning, hoping to have a catch up before their first classes. A few minutes before the bell, she finally appeared, but showed no interest in stopping to chat to her friends. I need to get to class, she said with a fixed determination and maintaining her brisk pace. The children all had English class together later that morning. Another opportunity, they thought, for Kazima to catch up with them. But no, the moment class had finished, she was first out of her seat and away. The boys couldn't help but feel hurt by their friend's dismissive attitude, even if they knew that it was just a consequence of the weekend's events. Aside from getting to see Kazima, there was a real feeling of anticipation around the, that first English class for another reason, how Becky would behave towards the boys after their meeting the previous night. David in particular had felt that he'd really stuck his neck out for Becky in persuading the others to give her a chance. This was her opportunity to show that she could prove her worth. To Becky's credit, she gave her full effort to get through the lesson without making a mockery of her classmates. The first few minutes were exceptionally tense, with all pupils waiting in silence to see who she, who she would target first. When the children clocked Becky calmly sitting on her chair waiting for the lesson to begin and showing absolutely no sign of saying or doing anything, everybody began to relax a little bit. Becky's real test came about halfway into the lesson. In a moment of clumsiness, Trevor had let his book slip off the edge of his, de his desk and, when he bent down to retrieve it, he managed to smack his head with an almighty bang as he went to sit back up again. Becky's friends all immediately started laughing as Trevor nursed his bumped head. Through their chuckles, they looked to Becky, confused as to why she wasn't joining in. He just banged his head, what's the big deal? She said, shrugging her shoulders. Becky's transformation didn't end with her new attitude towards the boys. Mr. Torrance was as equipped as always with a lesson filled with ways to chip at her self-esteem and confidence. But Becky didn't seem at all bothered by the way she was being treated by her teacher. It was as if she was being protected by some kind of invisible shield. Maybe it was just the knowledge of what was in store for Mr. Torrance that made her that way. But whatever cruel humiliation he threw at her left Becky quite unaffected. The first thing he got, to, got her to do was to read aloud. She did as she was told, and yes, she read badly. When Mr. Torrance listed all of her mispronunciations with glee, however, Becky merely shrugged with an expression that read, what did you expect? The teacher was obviously slightly irritated by the loss of power he had over his student. Mr. Torrance proceeded, therefore, to take every opportunity presented throughout the rest of the lesson to pull Becky up over every mistake he noticed in her work her personal appearance, or anything else he could think of. Still, Becky gave that same ambivalent look, which only served to make him more frustrated. The rest of the school week continued in much the same fashion. Becky continued to be sim seemingly immune to Mr Torrance's cruel treatment and resisted all temptation to direct cruel remarks of her own to her classmates. Kazima was seen during lessons, but always made a quick exit making it very clear that she was avoiding contact with the boys. Friday was the day they were all working towards. Among the plans for the school fair which Trevor had managed to get his hands on was a detailed itinerary of the day's, of the day's events. The baking competition was to be judged at noon on the Saturday, although the entries were to be presented to the fair by 9am the same morning, ready to be displayed to the public from the opening time an hour later. By the group's calculations, Mr Torrance was undoubtedly going to bake his cake on the Friday night after school. Any earlier than that would compromise its freshness and any later would involve an exceptionally early start on the Saturday morning. A plan was in place for David, Trevor and Becky to meet at the headquarters immediately after school, from which point they would make their way to Mr Torrance's house, which was conveniently only a short walk away from the outskirts of town. Things were slightly more complicated for Chris, who had the responsibility of both his sister and Brutus, but it was agreed that he would meet them all slightly later, as long as he was on time for his crucial interception. So, when the school bell marked the end of their school week, 
The children all went their separate ways. Becky travelled alone on foot via her, her family's flat to pick up some necessary supplies. David and Trevor both caught the bus and Chris made his way to the after school club to collect Amy, followed by a trip home to pick up Brutus. David and Trevor arrived at the headquarters first. Upon their arrival, Trevor immediately went about filling a rucksack with equipment for the mission. A pair of binoculars, a twin set of walkie-talkies and a hand-drawn floor plan of Mr Torrance's home. As he stuffed the latter of those items into the bag, David gave him a quizzical look, wondering how on earth he'd managed to resource such a useful map. Trevor, seemingly reading his friend's mind, proudly said he'd put in planning and permission for an extension five years ago. After a good bit of rooting around online, I hit the jackpot and found what we needed. Becky arrived at the headquarters a few minutes later, clutching a brown paper bag and barely able to contain her excitement. I've got exactly what we need, guys, she beamed. Boots Jolokia, a.k.a. North Indian Ghost Peppers. Over a million on the Scoville scale and one of the hottest chilies in the world. Some say they're hot enough to kill, but with just a small pinch inside that cake mix, we should manage to set a few mouths on fire without having to worry about the funeral costs. Where did you find those? I know we were looking to make maximum impact, but we don't want to hospitalise anyone, Becky, said David, staring at her in disbelief. The beauty of online shopping, Becky grins. You guys need to trust me on this one. I've done my research. As I say, just a small pinch will create the results we're looking for. Trevor gestured, gestured to Becky to pass him the paper bag and he added it to the other supplies in his rucksack before taking a concerned look at his wristwatch. We've got to get moving, he said. Mr. Torrance should be home any minute, and we've got to get in there before that cake goes in the oven. Otherwise, all this planning is for nothing. Becky and David both nodded, and they immediately all made their way back down the farm track. As the three children walked past the fields, Becky took it upon herself to remind them of the plan. This has to run like clockwork, she said. We must all stick to our roles if we're to succeed, and failure is not an option. Trevor, you're our lookout. You need to be completely on the ball and let us know straight away if things start to look hairy. Can I get a look at the map? Trevor hands to her the plans he'd, made, he'd found online. The kitchen's at the back of the building. We enter via the French doors leading to the back garden. You're certain, Trevor, that those are going to be left unlocked? Yes. He locks everything up just before he heads to bed, usually just after the 10 o'clock news, Trevor said counting himself lucky that his dad is trusting enough to let him go out without a curfew, which enabled him to carry out this necessary surveillance. Good, continued Becky. Chris, Amy and Brutus will be creating a diversion at the front of the house, whilst me and David will go in when the coast is clear. I'll be taking care of the cake mix, and David, you'll have a walkie-talkie and we'll be listening out for Trevor's signals. We should be in and out in less than a minute. We can do this. I've got a good feeling about this, said David, hoping that positive words would help ease his nerve nerves. One thing before we start, though. We haven't thought about your code name yet, Becky. David proceeded to tell her about their secret identities and where the names came from. She laughed when he explained about how he became known as Arthur and nodded when he spoke about how Kazima became Shikra, Trevor Snoop and Amy the Shrew. When he spoke of Chris's desire to replace his repulsed Chris Packet nickname with Brisket, Becky's cheeks reddened with a mixture of remorse and embarrassment. David racked his brains for an appropriate name for Becky. It was still hard to think of this person in a positive light after everything she'd put them all through. Eventually, he stopped thinking about the Becky he knew from English and started to think of the Becky he'd begun to know, know since. He thought of her surprise visit to the headquarters and how he saw a glimmer of her true personality and her interactions with Amy. How about Rubik's, he said suddenly, remembering the effortlessness with which she managed to solve Amy's puzzle. Rubik's, I like it, said Becky, feeling an unfamiliar sense of contentment at this small gesture of acceptance. And that's the end of the chapter. Bye.